That's, that's not a Christian song. And there are, there are sort of illustrations, and hallelujah obviously was stolen a little bit, uh, and, and it's used a little bit in context and out of context. But one of the things that we're talking about is, and I'll get back to that whole, that whole song and everything, but what on earth am I here for? This is a basic human question. And I believe that if you are alive, there was a purpose and a plan behind that. I really do. Um, I don't think things like life happen by accident. Okay? I don't think that you being here this Sunday morning is an accident. I think that there has been an amazing movement of many movement parts to get you here. And yes, it took a single act of willingness and obedience to take one foot and put it in front of the other and to walk to your car and come to church. And I appreciate that you're here. But this is one of the biggest questions that I would say throughout the world people are continuously asking. Even people that we would quote-unquote consider unrefined, uneducated. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Why, why am I alive? And so, as we move in this book, we're on going to be on like day 15, 14, depending on if you're where you're supposed to be. But I do want to challenge you, if you're not in a small group right now, and if you're not reading the book, and if you've already read it, I don't care. Um, this book came out in 2003. I promise you that if you look at it and you listen to it and you read it again, you're going to get something new out of it. How many of you guys, when you watch your favorite movies, only watch them one time? Me either. So don't let the devil put an excuse in your head. Oh, I already read that book. Because I guarantee if I went to page 72 and asked you what it said, you probably wouldn't know. <laughs> okay? So just check it out. This, one of the cool things about this is like, and I'm not trying to be mean, but out of every book on the planet, you have zero excuse not to read this because if you know how to type in Purpose Driven on YouTube, someone will read it to you for free. And they probably have a way better voice than you do. Just saying, okay? Something to think about. But, so we're on purpose number two, and it's this. You were formed for God's family, okay? How many of you guys have really weird memories about your family? How many of you guys have ever had weird things happen at Thanksgiving in your family? How many of you have ever seen someone fall asleep on Thanksgiving with your family? On the couch while watching the lions loose? Me too! <laughs> but we're talking about family, and really, fellowship is one of the weird terms that we use in the church to describe family, okay? So... A lot of you are like me. What on earth does fellowship mean? Well, don't worry. Google has her back. Let's check this out. Fellowship. It is the friendly association, especially with people who share one's interests. They valued fun and good fellowship at the, at the, as the cement of the community. I don't know how, that's the worst example I've ever read. I should probably change that, but that's essentially what it is. And so we're going to, in John 13, Jesus says this, okay? And this is sort of a good overview of what Jesus is talking about when he sort of phrases family and fellowship. I'm giving to you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You, you should love each other. <laughs> Your love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Okay? So that's talking about who? Is this talking about non-Christians or Christians? What? Christians. You're right. Because I'll explain this in a little bit here, but Christians are called to a higher platform because we have Jesus to help us actually love people it's easy to love people in your family it's easy to love people that you care about but jesus calls us to the next level in actually loving our enemies how many of you have an easy time loving people that are your enemies on my way home last night 
since I was preaching, everything always happens to me before I preach because that's the way God has a funny sense of humor. We were driving on 127, and everything was going good. All of a sudden, I thought I was having a like psychological episode because my headlights looked as if at the very end of them, there was like an additional wide beam with a tiny separation of darkness. I was really weirded out. I checked to see if I had my brights on, and I'm like, nope, okay, everything's good. Come to find out, some person who needs Jesus, because that's the way I say this, had a four-wheeler on a trailer without taillights. The four-wheeler was blocking the car taillights. And it was obviously pitch black outside because it was just really cloudy. It was raining. This was like at 7.30. And the person was going probably 65. And as you know, up north, it's 75 now. So thank God, like, I was actually paying attention. This per- I mean, you could not see a thing. It was pitch black. I was angry. I, like, flashed my headlights at them like 30 times. And then I pulled around to try it so that I didn't want them to hit me because I didn't know what they were doing. If they were changing lanes, I couldn't see anything. I was upset, but you know what? Jesus loves that guy. I tried in the moment, and I prayed for him that no, nobody would run into the back of him. But it's in those moments, it's hard to love people sometimes, okay? Jesus calls us to a, a higher level. That is why we come to church. Because church is supposed to be the place where you guys sort of get recharged a little bit. We get recharged, we hear God's word, and then we go out and try to love people the way Jesus wants us to. And when you miss church, you go roughly 14 days sometimes when you miss a single Sunday where you're sort of in the world so much that you need to refresh yourself daily. But being around brothers and sisters, being around a whole body, it gives us all power and encouragement. Okay, Fellowship is key because fellowship is one of the things that will allow you to actually grow in your faith. If you do not have fellowship, you may not grow. Check this out. There's a guy by the name of Dwight L. Moody. You guys might have heard of him. He says this, Church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood to a sick man. I want you to think about that. You might be asking yourself, well, you know, I, I like to worship God at my house. That's great. I do too, and you should. But the key thing is this. When a foot <laughs> leaves the body and hangs out 13 miles that direction, the body is crippled. Okay, We all have a part to play, and when you're not here, whether or not you know it, you may miss an opportunity that God was going to use you to speak into someone's life. So let's look at the Bibble, Bibble, Bibble Fellowship. I don't know why I spelled it like this. I'm so sorry. It, like I said, I was with junior hires all weekend, so I attested to that. I, I probably should have put biblical fellowship, but whatever. Bible, Bible fellowship. So check it out. you got yourself and your relationship with God. And this is all going to make sense. It's a little confusing. you got yourself and your relationship with God. That is a direct relationship, right? So we as Christians say we're following Jesus, and we accept God, and we are following him. Now, there is... A relationship that's occurring, a vertical, okay? Now, Denise also follows God. She's a believer, and she's also on the same vertical. If we do not get together, we cannot love God more. Why? Well, Jesus told us a little bit earlier. He said, I give you... A new commandment. Just, I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The church should be the most loving place on earth. We should take care of each other's needs. We should love people. There should not be secrets here. Um, People should be made aware when you're actually unhealthy or if you're struggling. You shouldn't be scared to talk about that because we should actually love you. We should not judge each other, but we should love. The church should be the most loving place on earth. And I want, to show you, I want you to understand this. If you don't get involved in the church, you're not going to be challenged. In terms of loving, okay? I guarantee you there are people here 
that I have upset you somehow, some way. There's people here that I probably have made a poor choice. Maybe I let junior hires enter a room of yours, or maybe I let, let them leave a mess, or maybe I made a comment in a brief um, brain fart moment that somehow hurt you, and I apologize for that. But this is a part of the loving thing. How many of you guys get along perfectly 100% of your time with your family? Brandy, put your hand up. <laughs> oh, man, I just lied on stage. God help me. Okay. Um, but my point is this. You know, as a fellowship, it's funny how we sometimes get upset that someone in the church hurts us, but yet we hurt each other in our own direct families. We have a little bit less relationship, and that's why it's important that on our vertical here with God that that relationship with God is happening because then it allows everybody to move up. Check this next one out. Biblical fellowship is this. It's learning how to love. And when you're not in a fellowship, when you're not around other believers, it's hard to learn how to love because you're not as challenged. You have to agree. There are certain personalities and people that you, for whatever reason, you were born in a certain way and you just do not necessarily get along with them. Guess what? They're part of the church. And isn't it awesome that God wants to challenge you and teach you in spite of a birth, like, angst against somebody, that God wants you to still love them. I don't care if your personalities are completely different. I don't care if you guys are like fire and ice. In Jesus' mind, we have to love everyone, not just the people that it's easy to hang out with. Okay? Because that's easy. So we're moving this along. And we're, I want you guys, uh, girls, with the uh, handouts. Allie, Mary, you got them? Stand up. I've got 60 handouts. If you want one and you get ADD, I suggest you take one. If you fall asleep during my sermon and you don't have one of these sheets, I will scream at you. You think I'm kidding. I'm not. Um, now that I have a beard, I can do that. Brandy told me. Um, but if you guys need a sheet, I've got about 60. These are fill in the blank. These have additional Bible verses. If you're one of those people that loves to take notes, I suggest you utilize one of these. Um, if you don't want one, that's cool. You'll still understand everything I want to talk about today. I'm sorry the print is so small. As you know, working with computers, sometimes what you see on the screen is absolutely not what you get, um, especially when it goes to a printer. Uh, so... If you need, uh, like, a magnifying glass, I'm really sorry. Ask your neighbor. I don't have one. But let's move into this. Okay, so we're talking about fellowship, which fellowship is what? You guys read the blue letters. Fellowship is? Fellowship is? Fellowship is? Okay, how many of you guys would say you have an amazing handle on how to love people that you don't like? Me either. I'm, I'm a work in progress. As I, at last night, that guy's lucky I didn't go, pull off the road and attack him in the car. But um, we're going to go to this. The four levels of fellowship. Learning how to lev, love. Love. I'm not talking right today. Level one. If you guys have a sheet of paper, this would be probably the top fill in the blank. Level one. The fellowship of sharing together. Right now, we are sharing together in service. We're here. We're sharing. Some of you guys know things about my family and some of the things that are happening. I know the things that are happening in your life through prayer. Um, there's other side conversations. We are sharing. It says this in Acts 2.44. All the believers met together constantly and shared everything with each other. You know what I love about this verse? I want you to think about this. How many of you guys have ever been around your family constantly? You know how I said that fellowship is learning how to love each other? The believers were around each other constantly. How many of you guys can be around your significant other or your wife constantly and not get into an argument? Anybody? Me either. Sorry, honey. I love you, but not that much. Um, but... So the next two things, the bottom line is this, you know, families are messy, families are not perfect, families 
you're also comfortable in, though. That's what's weird about it, right? It's like you get in fights, you have disagreements, but no matter at the end of the day, you all come together most of the time. But my, that's the kind of striving we have for the church. That's why it's important that you're here because you're not going to be stretched unless you are. I mean, seriously. Work on a committee in any church. I promise you there's going to be nights where you leave and are, or you're upset about something, okay? Because we've got 10 people trying to reach a common goal. Guess what? Yes, we disagree. And it's okay because God loves us. We pray and we move on. But that's the way life is. Fellowship is sort of like that. It's not scary. It's just natural. Um, I don't know why we expect the church to look any different than our own home lives. But sometimes it's like we put the church on a pedestal. But the reality is through Christ, we can achieve a lot of good things, even though we're not necessarily related like in the worldly sense. We're related spiritually. It's that whole idea that because of Jesus, we are united. And because of that unification, we can love each other the way Jesus wants us to. So what do we share in fellowship. So these are the two fill in the blanks on the top. First, we share experience. And second, we share support. Some of you guys have uh, jumped into the purpose driven small groups, and that is awesome. I highly encourage you to not lose heart. And uh, because guess what? Small groups are a laboratory to learn how to love. You may think there are really weird people in your small group. And your small group may think that you're really weird, okay? But the point of this is small groups are a laboratory to learn how to love. It's in a small group setting that a lot of this is going to transpire. The big church is great, but it's, it's just one of those things. It's got a unique thing. And um, level two is this. It's called the fellowship of belonging. The fellowship of belonging. Ephesians 2.19 says this, You are members of God's very own family, and you belong in God's, households with every, God's household with every other Christian. I love 1 Peter. This one's great. 1 Peter 2.17, Love your spiritual family. <laughs> I love it when the Bible is just really straightforward. But if you really look at this verse and you really think about that, that's a lot harder than the four words that are up on the screen. That means as you move into fellowship, as you get to know people, as you spend more time with them, as you get to know them, there's a good chance you may find out something about that person that you may find annoying. Right? What does the saying go? Ignorance is bliss. It's like when Brandy and I were first dating and how the things that we thought were, you know, cute are the exact same things that in our first year of marriage drove us nuts. The opposites attract and then you're married and you're like, wow, that was really cute when we were dating. Now I want to punch a wall. And it's true, though. It's just an interesting dynamic, right? God's sort of got this sense of humor. You know, love your spiritual family. And I, I have so many verses that I could have used for this. It's crazy. But First Peter 4.9 says this. I love this one, too. Open your homes to each other without complaining. I need this one. I'm going to tell you. Brandy tells me that some, some, so-and-so is coming over, and we got to clean and do the dishes. I wish I could say I don't complain, but I do. Oh, darn it. I got to clean the bathroom now, and the kids have been throwing stuff all over, and, you know, this is, they're going to for sure use the bathroom, even though they're here for three minutes. I mean, we got to clean that, <laughs> you know, and you just get all in an uproar. The Bible's like, no, just open your home without complaining. Who cares if your house is a little bit messy? Everyone has had a messy home at one time or another, unless you're perfect, then you should do a cleaning service and clean our homes who are not perfect, okay? Because we need you. And so, I mean, it's just, it's just interesting. We sort of get caught up. And the funny thing about fellowship is it is a lot, church in general, I mean, come on, let's be honest, church sometimes is just weird. I mean, if you think about it, if you've never been to church before, like the things we do, like, if you don't know the songs that we sing, it's really awkward. Let me tell you. You sort of stand here, and you're, like, looking around. Then people, like, do a pitch change. And you're like, ooh, yeah, uh, I totally don't know what's happening right now. 
And then you like start moving your mouth and you're like, yeah, I've never heard this song before. It must be from 1943. And, uh, you know, but seriously, church and small groups and relationships are sometimes like this video. Check this out. Get it, get it figured out. I'll come back to it. Just keep on. He's going to keep on messing with it. But we'll go to level three. We'll come back to it. I can tie it in. We'll go to level three. The fellowship of serving together. So if we were to move through this idea of sort of building a relationship with somebody, serving is one of the key ones. Why? Why do you think serving is important to someone who's creating, learning how to love and and just in a fellowship in that situation? Why do you think serving is a big deal? I'm asking your opinion. So you guys, you're free to talk. You don't have to raise your hand. This isn't school. Okay, maybe they've never had it in their life growing up. What else? We're showing God's love. What else? You're doing it together. What else? Everybody needs help now and then. One of the key things that as a Christian community, one of the key things as a Christian is we're supposed to see a need and meet it. The Bible's very clear on that. It says, look at the widows and orphans, you know, how can you follow me if you don't? I'm paraphrasing completely, but essentially says, look at the widows and orphans. If you love me, you will, you will do that, you know, and so, um, so, I mean, seriously, sometimes, like, trying to break in, like, I don't know if you guys have ever visited churches where you don't know anybody, but sometimes it sort of feels a little bit like that. Like, you're like, what is going on right now, and why am I lost? Because I have no clue. And, and you know, the fellowship that we're looking for is, is that kind of environment right there where it's okay to be Ray. <laughs> it's okay to be Ray and not know what's going on. No one's going to no one's gonna make fun of you. Yeah, we laughed at him, but, I mean, really, and it, sometimes we just, man, we got to laugh like that. We got to understand that being a Christian is tough. It really is. It's not easy. It's not easy to love people the way Jesus did, okay? It isn't. And if you think it is, man, come see me because I got some people I want you to meet, okay? And I mean that in the best way possible. But the, po- the point of this is, you know, as a family, you're going to have times where it's just awkward and you don't really know what's going on and you're trying to love like Jesus and it's okay if you fail. It's okay. Just laugh and be like, God, man, you got a good sense of humor that you put this person in my life and you expect me to love them. I'm really trying, but I need you to use your love, not mine, because mine has already sailed. It's gone out to sea. I need your love to love this person, not me. And really, that's a great way to approach things, isn't it? Moving back to level three, I talked about the fellowship of serving. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says this, Two people are better than one because they get more done by working together. Two people are better than one because they get more done by working together. How many of you guys were here the Sunday that we decided to serve at South School? Raise your hand if you participate in that. You know, South School has, I don't know, probably what, some of you guys work there. How many janitors, custodians? two or three, and we showed up and we did probably what would take them quite, quite a many days to do. We did it in an afternoon. We had fun doing it. We, we worked together, and, and fellowship is sort of like that. As you serve, you accomplish things because the bottom line is this. How are people going to know and see Jesus Christ's love if we just hang out together in a, in a little social club of cool people that follow Jesus? They're not. Because it's really comfortable to be around your friends. It's really comfortable to hang out with people that are exactly like you, that have the exact same interests as you, that like the same music as you do, that understand your hidden language like salvation and redemption and washed by the blood. It's really fun to hang around with people like that, but it's challenging when you get outside of that. And that's why we serve. We have to leave our little groups and we go out together and we love people that are not like us. Why? Because that's what we're doing. We're learning how to love. God calls us to that. And as you build that relationship, not only does your group get stronger, but you're actually able to show people love. Remember the song the girls sang? 
the last line, it talks about this. And it's, and it's sort of like this interesting conversation of doubt and, and spiritual discovery. And I have no idea whether or not Leonard, Leonard Cohen was a Christian. I don't, I don't have a clue. I didn't look that up. I don't know him personally. I don't know. But I do know this. Lyrically, it says this. There was a time you let me know what's really going on below, but now you never show that to me, do you? But remember when I moved in you and the holy dove was moving too and every breath we drew was hallelujah. Then he goes on to say this. Maybe there's a God above. All I've ever learned from love was how to shoot somebody who outdrew you. Isn't that sad? If that's really all you've ever learned from love, that means that us, we, are not doing our jobs. If you only see love that is self-seeking, love that is all about you and non-Christ-like, then man, maybe you might have this opinion. Maybe you view God in that same way. And yes, I think at that point, if that's his experience of love, if that's his experience of fellowship or whatever his community or background was, he says maybe there's a God above because he hasn't seen love. When you experience the love of Christ, you don't say maybe anymore. When you really experience it, you understand that there is a God above. Somebody who would compel you to do something that is completely not in your interest. Look at Jesus. What did he do? He died for people that hated him. He died for people that spat upon him. He died for people that arranged one of the most crazy framings you've ever seen in history, a payoff of silver to one of his best friends who kissed him on the cheek and wished him well. And Jesus still went through with everything, even though he had the power to crush everybody, even though he was able to completely change the situation, even though he physically did not want to do it. He was sweating drops of blood because of the amount of just weight that was on his shoulders. He still went through it out of love. That is real love. That is true love. And that's what we're talking about in level number four, the fellowship of suffering together. This is tough. This one's tough. But this is where the rubber meets the road. When uh, Brandy and I moved back we moved back from Texas. Um, we had just had Raya, and I, we had been talking to my dad on the phone. I was done with this year-long internship, and my father had been getting tests done, but like a lot of men and a lot of males and a lot of you know, people who are blue-collar and tough, he, he didn't really want to share anything that was going on in his life that would be negative health-wise, even with his son. I, I heard it in his voice. And I told Brandy, she was on a three-month maternity leave, just had Raya. We had to move out of her apartment, and we just made a decision. I said, you know, honey, I, I just feel like we need to go up north. I need, to, I need to see my dad. I need to figure out what's going on because there's just something in his voice. I came up, and my dad was extremely far along with cancer. Um, his voice actually was changing, and it continued to change. And it was in that suffering that I watched, I watched my dad deal with dying. And it was hard. And you know what? People from his fellowship, people from his community that he had known for years, they showed up and they sat with him outside. When all he ever wanted to do was lay on a swing outside, they showed up and they sat with him. And that kind of love that kind of suffering alongside someone who's having a really hard time physically, it's one of the greatest kinds of love because I'm going to tell you, it is one of the most needed things is to know you're not alone. And when you show up in a situation that is extremely uncomfortable, I mean, what do you say? You know, I'm sorry you're dying. <laughs> My dad was aware of that. But people showed up and they sat with him. And this is what God is talking about when you really love people and you're willing to feel the brunt of that pain and that emotion. This is what we're talking about, the, the, the suffering together. That's real love. Because let me tell you, it's not easy showing up sometimes. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. But guess what? You show up anyway because you know Jesus would want you to. And you probably cry. You're probably a little bit sad, 
but you follow in Jesus' footsteps and you understand a little bit of what he went through for us. Last but definitely not least, I want to ask you a personal question. And this is about your fellowship level at this church. Like, how, how plugged in are you? Are you, are you attending? Are you, are you just showing up every other Sunday? Because, you know, we have a big vision to love God, love each other, and love community. But I'm going to tell you, the love each other part happens out of this kind of location. It starts here. You meet people, and you join together serving others. And in the midst of that, yes, you're going to run into things that are tough. Yes, you're going to run into, run into people that you may not like. But guess what? Jesus says, I don't care. You've got to love them anyways, because I did. I loved you, and I know you. <laughs> I know your thoughts. And I know who you really are. I still loved you, and I still died on the cross. And Jesus says, if I can do that for you, and you know you better than anybody else, how much more should you do that for someone else? So here, here we are. I want you to just check this out. What level are you? Sharing together, that's sort of a, that's sort of a friendship level. It means you're, you're making acquaintances, you're meeting new people, you're making friends. Second one, belonging together. That's more of a membership level. This is where you start to, you've built friendships here at the church and, and, you're, and you're understanding your purpose and you're starting to, to look at God and everything and you're starting to explore your, your faith, your spirituality, spirituality. I don't know where you're at with God, but it, it, this is sort of a natural progression. You start to plug in. You start to volunteer. In the Church of God, we don't have a membership class, okay? Why is that? Well, we believed a long time ago, and we sort of still carry this today, we believe that if we force you and indoctrinate you outside of the Bible, then we're sort of moving away from God, okay? So when you attend this church on a regular basis, you basically become members. It's really that simple. We don't make you profess a creed. Um, other than believing in Jesus Christ, you just show up and you're a member, okay? Third, serving together. That's like a partnership, right? Claire, come here. So if Claire and I were, let, Claire really likes um, organic foods, so let's just pretend for, for sake of pretending that I was going to Claire's house because Brandy told me to, which is exactly what would happen. I go over to her house. Claire's got this amazing garden, which you did, right? Maybe still do. And I, for whatever reason, Claire's holding her baby, and I need to pull the organic squash out of her garden. It's a partnership, right? But I have to show up physically to be in a partnership. I have to show up and go and get that squash. And Claire's got to be there to let me in, and it's a partnership. Yeah, supervised, because, you know, I wouldn't want to steal more than one squash, because she would kill me. She'd be like, I have 13 squash. I only have 11. I only gave you one. I was planning on making squash soup. But, you know, that, it's, it's, it's something where we're going together. It, it's serving together. It is a partnership because you're working alongside with somebody. And let me tell you, I've done a couple of youth events where a youth has had a hammer this big, and I've been three feet away, and I've been scared for my life. That's a definite partnership. When someone's got a sledgehammer, and they're just whipping around willy-nilly, and you're underneath a wall that's load-bearing, it's a little scary. Okay, But that's the kind of partnership we're talking about. And then last but definitely not least, the, the sort of the culmination of this is suffering together. And that, that's really where the kinship happens. That's where you become a real family. You know? Brandy and I have been married for quite a long time. And we've gone through quite a bit of suffering. Sometimes at our own hands, okay? In that relationship. Sometimes, you know. And honestly, on the outside of that, on the upside of that, we're, we're a lot stronger. You know, we are. And that suffering, it builds a faith. It builds a unity unlike the best days you've ever had because you're in the darkest part and you're still there and you're still going and you rise up out of it with God's love, with God's help. That's the kind of kinship that we're talking about. That's when you become a real family. When you love somebody even in spite of situations or the darkness that you've seen in them. You just love through that pain. That's a family. That's the family of God right there. And that's why it's scary. I want to end with this. Galatians 6 2 says this Share each other's troubles and problems. This way, in this way, obey the law of Christ. I think it's dangerous. 
for people to get real. I think people have a natural, innate fear in them that if they tell the truth about what's going on in their life in the church, about if they're doubting God, if they say maybe there's a God above, that people are going to look down upon them, that they're going to be sort of ostracized, that people aren't going to pay attention, and they're going to be less loved. But I want to tell you, no, that's not the case. We've all been there, and, and honesty has a way of healing. The devil loves secrets. He does, because it maintains power over you. A secret will always maintain power over you, but honesty will free you. Being real will free you. Loving openly will free you. And when you can honestly share, you know, hey, I'm dealing with this in my life. I'm physically having issues. Could you please pray for me? I don't know if you've ever sort of been in that spot where you're actually dealing with something and you didn't want to share it because you're just sort of, I don't know, nervous. But it's in that moment where you're real and you're honest that you become one in a fellowship, that you're starting to let your walls down, that you can actually learn to love people and that we can be the body of Christ. So I want to challenge you, show up. Man, if you're not doing Purpose Driven Life, I encourage you, it is one of the best books I have personally read on spiritual development. It walks you through everything. Um, I don't care where you're at with God. Maybe you're at the point where, hey, maybe there's a God above. Maybe you've been with, uh, in a relationship with God where you have following him for many, many years. You can get something out of this. And when you do, show up to church and get plugged in. Serve with us. Show up in the times that people are suffering and offer help because, honestly, you will be more blessed than the person you blessed. Okay? I challenge you today. So let's go to God in prayer. God, I thank you so much for each person here. Um, thank you so much for Ray Romano and his weird uh, exercise class. I will never forget that. And uh, thank you that even though sometimes we act like him or sometimes we <laughs> come to a church that sort of acts weird like that, like today, like me, um, God, that you are above us all, that you want us to love each other in spite of our own just issues and that we need to love people the way Jesus would. We just lift this up in your precious, wonderful name. Amen.